Thank you very much, Michael. I do hope you haven't oversold me there, but I'll do my best. So I'm going to um, start sharing my screen, which is going to be far more entertaining, one would hope, than my face. So here we go. So um, first thing, I am a local language teacher. Um, good evening, as I might say in old English for you. I was uh, given this opportunity to uh, actually have a little talk about old English, but I just wanted to preface it first of all by saying I'm by no means any sort of expert or authority on this. I'm more of a, a very keen amateur. It's something which uh, took my fancy uh, a number of years ago, so over, well, knocking on the door of 30 years ago, and it was due to the fact that um, I decided to study English for my A-levels. And um, the English that I started studying was something called English language, which was brand new for my school. Um, I knew I didn't, whilst I quite liked literature, I knew it wasn't something I wanted to study in massive depth. Um, so I studied Old English, which was the, the structure of the language, the, uh, the dialects which are associated with the language. And the first thing that we did when we looked at Old English is we looked at Beowulf. And Beowulf, lots of you will be familiar with, is probably the most uh, famous piece of Old English literature that there is. It's probably the most uh, complete documentary piece of Old English that there is. Um, and the thing that struck me immediately, and we'll have an expert reading it a bit later if I can get YouTube to work, is just quite how uh, visceral and earthy um, Old English was and how I could just hear echoes of modern English also quite a lot of the German that I was studying as well. So you may be able to see on this um, uh, the, the little fragment you can see here that this is the opening sequence from Beowulf, which starts with what we are in year dagum. And it's immediately grabs you by um, the hair when it starts you off with what, which is the old English version of the modern English word what, but it's a calling people to listen. So it's a, a very atmospheric evocation of sitting, sitting around a, a mead hall, um, a storyteller or a scop, as they were called, an Anglo-Saxon poet, telling you this story of during do, of monsters and heroes and dragons. Um, and it was, yeah, a really seductive thing. So we, we'll look at it a little bit later. But prior to doing that, I just wanted to have a little look at some of the, um, the things which get there. So we're going to go a little bit back in time. This I found this and shamelessly robbed it, although I have, if you can see it on the PowerPoint, I have uh, um, credited it to Sabio Lance, who's a, a blogger. You can find his stuff on um, Pinterest, who's created this really excellent one-page um, infogram or uh, diagram of something which contains pretty much all of the progression of Old English even prior to Old English, all the way to Modern English. So you can see that the Celts who came from continental Europe, some estimates say a thousand years BC, um, then the, the Roman uh, occupation of Britain, uh, which started a little before uh, BC, so 43 BC, and then they subsequently left in the, the fifth century. And here's the bit that we're interested in, which is the, the start of the Germanic settlements, which started in the fifth century. So they started, um, and nobody's entirely sure how these um, actually manifested themselves, whether these were actually invasions or rather um, trading visits, which then left to settlement and colonisation. There's lots of archaeological evidence which seems to suggest that there wasn't really an invasion of Anglo-Saxons, but rather a kind of an integration. But it set, it set the foundation for what would become our language in the next sort of six, 700 years. And this is the thing we're talking about today, Old English. If you look at the um, diagram at the bottom, you've got a very excellent um, and clear delineation between the three principal stages of English. So 500, pro approximately speaking, so sort of 5th, 6th century, all the way to the 11th century, 12th century, is the period of Old English. And that's what we're looking at today. Post the Norman conquest of the 11th century, 1066, English gets flooded with um, French terms from Anglo-Norman. So the language changes 
immeasurably. Um, we've got a lot of change happening then, all the way through to early modern English, Shakespeare, and then modern day English, which is what we know of today. But if we zoom back even further in time, here's um, a, a map scheme, which um, I, again, I shamelessly robbed from Wikipedia this time, which gives you an indication of something called PI or P-I-E. You were the, the excellent uh, infogram that I'll diagram that I was telling you about earlier, you didn't see. So all you saw is the Sutton Hoo helmet there. So what I was explaining about was the, um, the history or the development of Old English all the way to Modern English. So this, hopefully it's moved on to the next slide, you'll see is um, at the top left is a map of continental Europe. And you will see that the, the colored in pieces are really a trace of where the the first speakers of Proto-Indo-European, these are the first speakers of languages like English, French, Iranian, so Persian, um, Turkish, all of the languages pretty much of Northern Asia and Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Northern Europe. The first speakers of that would have been... Um, probably, and linguists don't know for definite, they probably appeared from Central Europe, from uh, the Caspian steppe, something like that, maybe as much as 6,000 years ago. And all of the languages of Europe, with very few exceptions, came from this, this thing called Proto-Indo-European. This would have snazzily zoomed in. Um, unfortunately, the zoom is now gone. So you'll see, and I'm going to zoom in on it on a, the next slide, this is a tree diagram, which just gives you a little bit of an indication of the interrelatedness of languages from the Proto-Indo-European languages. So the Proto-Germanic languages, so the languages which derive from German or G Germanic roots, they're the ones which I've circled here. So you'll see that they are split into West Germanic languages, which are the ones like English, Frisian, which is the... Um, the closest language to English that still um, exists, German, Dutch, and Flemish. They're all West Germanic languages. Another branch there you'll see are the North Germanic languages. So these are languages which are related to, they came from Proto-Indo-European, which then came from Proto-Germanic, but they differ slightly, but we know them today as languages like Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, Icelandic. And then you've got a little branch there, which is now, sadly, dead, the Gothic language, which was the East Germanic branch of the, um, the group of languages uh, that no longer exists. One of the things which helps us to be able to reconstruct what ancient forms of Germanic languages were like was the fact that Gothic actually was a language which um, quite a big chunk of the Bible was translated into um, before it went extinct, which was very useful for linguists. So... If we think about English and we think about English, you know, the word hoard or the, um, the vocabulary of English as a pie, and here's a pie chart representing it, you'll see that the greater part of it, so over 50% of that, so knocking on the door of 60%, is made up of Latinate or Romance or French-based words. So these are often the words which, um, if you see a page of French or Spanish or Italian written, you'll be able to recognise because they look very much like an English word. But you'll see that the Germanic languages, only 26% of what we speak today is actually a Germanic language. So there's a question mark as to whether English is still a Germanic language. But if you look at the 100 most frequently used words in English, which is this is the, um, the list that I've got here and the credit is below it, only three are non-Germanic. So the core of our modern English that we speak today has its roots 1500 years ago so the words like the and of and 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 a and to and in they're all words which came originally from old english what they say is if you want to hear old english spoken listen to the language of a toddler because two and three year olds speak primarily or almost exclusively old english so the monosyllabic short function important words which we use every day still are old english so that's something that's definitely worth bearing in mind. So as we move on now, English, it's important to recognise that Old English wasn't one big block of stuff. Um, 
it was six or seven hundred years in the making. So it changed a lot over time, but also it changed a lot from area to area. So here's a, um, a, um, a map from Wikipedia, which shows us the four principal dialect areas of Old English. So you can see just tucked away in the corner for us, us is the, the dialect that would have been spoken in this area, which is Kentish. Um, but the others, the, the probably the dominant forms of the language would be things like West Saxon, which is the one which um, the greatest amount of documentary writing is in. And then you've got Mercian, which you can see is a big chunk of the centre of the country. And then Northumbrian, which is all the way up um, as we edge towards Scotland. Interestingly, if you look at the map, the white spaces towards the east, so the west, sorry, are where the... Um, the Britons were pushed towards. So this is Cornwall in the far southwest of England and Wales, and obviously as you go up towards Scotland. So they retained their own Celtic languages rather than English, although obviously over time English did become the preeminent language. Um, and in fact, was um, it was one of the things which was um, enforced at some, po at some point in time. Um, if we go on to... Um, um, yeah, we'll keep on the same slide. You'll see that from the ninth century on, the bits which are Mercian and Northumbrian, they start to, in, to see a big influx of Vikings. This is another big change to the language which we see at that time. It's um, something which doesn't affect West Saxon and Kentish as much. We'll come on to that in a bit. Um, but the, um, the Saxon area, the West Saxon area, was to a greater or lesser extent protected by Alfred the Great, and we will find out a bit about him a little later. So let's keep it a little bit local. Unfortunately, this would have been an incredibly interesting reveal as opposed to um, what it is at the minute. So here's a map of the borough of Bromley, and you'll see that on the borough of Bromley that um, we've got records dating back all the way to the ninth century of Anglo-Saxon or Old English names for local areas. So the, the earliest one, and there's a, a few here, is actually the mention of the River Cray. And the River Cray, it seems to mean something like clear water or running water, but that's the first mention. So right at the beginning of the ninth century, that's the first mention. So obviously we've got that in St. Mary Cray, St. Paul's Cray, um, Crayford as well, which is not in our borough, but is also on the River Cray. Then there's a glut of, um, we've got quite a few there all at once. So we've got, um, um, we've got here, we've got um, Farnborough in 1862. So that means like a clearing in the ferns. We've got, um, or um, you've got um, uh, Mottingham. So those, that's the people of uh, Moda in, that's also in 862 is a bit f further on in the, the ninth century. West Wickham, it looks like the, the Wickham part of it, Ham is like a settlement, but the Wickham part was probably a corruption of the Latin word vicus. Um, we've got um, Beckenham, which is um, Beck's um, settlement as well, which was happened in the late ninth century. Bromley or, or Bromley, which, which would have been a clearing in the, the broom um, here. And then as we move on to the 10th century, Chiselhurst. So Chisel is anybody who's ever been to Chesil Beach in Dorset will familiar, be familiar with that word. That's the old English word for gravel. So it's also in the modern German word Kiesel. So it's a, it's a, like a gravel um, reference, again, a topographical or a geographical reference to what's there. And then if we go all the way through to the 11th century, the final one, which was recorded before the influx of the... Um, of the, the Anglo-Normans of the um, after the Norman conquest, Orpendingitun, uh, which is to do with the, the name Orped, which is an old English name. So it's the settlement of, or the town of, or for Orped. So you can see that the, um, the borough of Bromley has got quite a long established history when it comes to old English. Um, and you can still see it in the same names that we've got today. Some of them, by the way, are common names, aren't they? So Farnborough, uh, is, there isn't one Farnborough in this country. There's at least two. There's one um, down on, near the south coast. And the meaning will be the same. So this is one of the greatest influences and one of the things which changed the, uh, the, the fate of English, probably greater than anybody else. 
Um, people often talk about the influence of Shakespeare, obviously, which goes without saying. People talk about the King James Bible as well in terms of influencing the language. But if you were to name one individual who probably had the greatest influence on Old English and what happened to Old English, it would be Alfred the Great. Um, so not only did he uh, establish quite a lot of legal and um, um, administrative norms, which became uh, important immediately during his reign. So things like uh, the um, like taxations and things like that. Uh, as well as that, he, he spent invested a massive amount of time, energy and money into reviving and consolidating the English language. So this is a quotation from Alfred the Great. Learning had declined so thoroughly in England that there were very few men on this side of the Humber. So in other words, that weren't in Northumbria who could understand their divine services in English or even translate a single letter from Latin into English. And I suppose that there were not many beyond the Humber either. So there became, and this wasn't just, um, it wasn't just England that suffered from this, but there became like an impoverishment of the quality of um, being scholarly in sometimes called the dark ages. And the reason it was called the dark ages is because there's a general perception that learning and the love of learning and the, the wanting to discover and the, the classical motives behind things like ancient Greek and Roman study, they were all gone. That's, there was a, certainly a feeling of that. But Alfred the Great was someone who, despite having a reputation for burning cakes, he was a huge backer of English as an important language, as a language which stood up um, next to Latin as being not just the language of the vernacular, so not just the spoken language, but it had an equal status to Latin. So that's, um, he's an important um, figure, uh, an incredibly important um, figure when it comes to the retaining of the standard of English. It also led to the version of English, remembering that the English capital at the time was set in Winchester rather than London, the version of English which was becoming the preeminent one was West Saxon. Um, increasingly, when the Vikings were starting to invade more and more, as we went into what became known as the Dane law, writing, literature, recording of uh, things via words became less and less important. So the Vikings. So the map that you see here is an indication of the influence of the Dane law. You may remember this from history lessons at school, but from the ninth century on, the Vikings were pillaging, um, invading, uh, raiding, uh, primarily the north and eastern coasts of England. It was an easy target. There were lots of very wealthy, poorly protected monasteries, which they, you know, they took great delight in in the harrying and attacking and you can see that the Dane law was an actually officially sanctioned area which came under Viking rule and it pretty much split the country in two so Wessex and its dependencies so this is a lot to do with how the fact that uh, King Alfred was able to repel the Vikings they um, retained quite a lot of the what we would call the old English whereas English was now starting to be flooded with Scandinavian import. So these are things which are Viking words. So if we think about that pie chart from earlier, when only around about 26% of the words or the word hoard of English was of Germanic origin, if we think only of the Germanic words, around 50% of the words which we have in modern English could either be Old English or Old Norse. So they, the words which we have, we're not entirely sure. Ones which were Old English only, it's around 36%. And the words which are purely Old Norse, so Viking words, we think around about 14%. Those estimates vary anything between 600 to 1,000 words in modern English, which come from the Vikings. So here are some of the words which we have in modern English. English, which are from Norse origins. So you've got the word knif, which is our word knife. Any studiers of modern German will know that the word for knife doesn't look anything like that in the Germanic languages. 
happy, which is also related to words like happenstance or perhaps. Hap means to do with uh, good fortune. We've also got the word hapless, don't we? Somebody who doesn't have luck. Me when it comes to presentations, apparently. <laughs> Window, which is the um, the what you would call, I suppose, a composite or a compound noun of the Norse vind, which is wind, and alga, which is eye. So it's the wind's eye, is the modern English word window. Husband, so hus bondi, or hus is the word for a house. Bondi is the person who kind of looked after the house, was the uh, protector of the house, the occupier of the house. So that's what the husband means. And as it's Thursday, Thor's dark, Thursday, Thor's day. We get quite a lot of the common days of the week and stuff like that from Norse as well. Now, this isn't going to work at all now because I can't animate. But um, what this ended up doing is that um, English, as you may know, um, is has an incredibly wide, broad uh, word hoard or vocabulary. So when in English you want to think of a word, there's often two, three, four synonyms for the same thing. So this is something which not all European languages have. And one of the principal reasons why we've got so many words for so many things, rather than just the one word, is the fact that we've got multiple sources. So we have often the old English root word, and then you have a Norse word, a Viking word, which might have come as well. So um, here are some of the words which we see in modern English, but sometimes they've got a Norse version and an old English version because the sounds were slightly different. So one of the things which denotes or connotes uh, a Viking word or an old Norse word might be the hard G in words, which is lost in old English or the consonant shift had already happened which meant that Old English no longer has it. So words like the guild, like guild hall, that's the, related to the Old English yield rather than guild. Our word yawn is the Old Norse or the Viking word gap or gape. So it's the opening of something, which is also related to the word gasp. There's also a school of thought that quite a lot of the word hoard of English, which relates to uh, violent or scary things actually comes from Old Norse as well. So things like ugly, which is an Old Norse word. Um, so uga means to be afraid of, and the idea of being, or ugliga, means that if you are fearsome, then you, are, you might be ugly. You've got things like edge, which has got that soft j sound on the end of it, whereas the Norse word had the hard sound, egg, now, this isn't an egg that you crack and make an omelette with, but the idea of egging somebody on to do something. So this is you edge them on, you push them on, you prod them on, you make them do it. So that's the modern English, which we've got egg and edge. Nor, which is the old English word for like chewing on something. The old Norse is nag. So it would have been gnawan in old English because the G would have been pronounced. Nag is obviously related to it, but it's got that hard G on the end rather than the W. The word to tow, which is the word to tug in Viking or in Old Norse. So again, you can see that hard G and draw in Old English, which means to pull, originally meant to pull, like when you draw a gun or something like that, as opposed to the Old English, which is drag. You can see again that hard G. And words which are related to that include draft, like in draft beer, or a draft animal, which is all to do with pulling, like a horse does, and dregs, which is the stuff which falls to the bottom of a barrel or water, whatever it is, the things that are pulled to the bottom. It's the, the, the lowly stuff, the stuff that you don't necessarily want. So, oh, yes, it's not going to work like that. Other things that you might notice is that the... SK sound in uh, modern English, of which there are lots of words which have a sk in it. For instance, the word sky comes from the Old Norse ski, which meant cloud. The Old English word was heofnum, which is related to our word heaven. But sk words are nearly always Norse words. For whatever reason, Old English seems to have not liked sk words. So words which you see in Old English are more likely to be sh words. 
So one of the words which um, is often shown as the example of this is the word for skirt and shirt, which are actually originally cognate words. They are the same word. They come from the cousin languages, which were Old Norse and Old, Ling Old English. And they've got something to do with a piece of garment that's been cut in a certain way. And that sk sound or sh in modern in Old English is to do with cutting or cleaving. So you've got shave and shear. And ship is to do with the cutting of the beams of wood that you'd make the ship with. Shed, shin, which is the, the cut or the split or the, the bit between your leg or your knee and your foot. Sheath, which is where you would put your sword. And the Norse words, which are those pairs, would be things like ski and skid and scratch and scrape. So ski, you can think of, you think about those play, um, those planks of wood, which would make the ship. That's what originally the ski was. The skids, which were originally a noun, not a verb, were the timbers, which you might have put something on to roll and move to make it easier. Those were skids. So you can see pairs in those two languages. Um, I keep forgetting I can't move it like that. So to come full circle, Beowulf, probably the most famous piece of old English literature. There are lots of others, lots of others that are very worth uh, looking at if you're interested in old English. But Beowulf is the one which has been adapted into films. It's been translated multiple times. Um, it's a very complete piece of epic poetry. It was written, people think, scholars think, late 10th century or early 11th century. So even by this time, it's likely that Old English has moved quite a lot from when it first appeared on the islands, you know, five centuries before. It's alliterative. We're going to talk about Old English alliteration in a second. Um, and it was designed to be performed. So the fact that it was written, most scholars seem to think today, it would have been the first time in hundreds of years that it would have been written. It would have normally been performed by a, an Anglo-Saxon um, musician poet, a scop, who would have um, played it accompanied by music. Um, normally something like you're about to see the Anglo-Saxon lyre. So I was going to play for you a small, small extract from the beginning of Beowulf, just a couple of words to give you a flavour of what that would have sounded like. So here's where it goes wrong again. I'm going to try my best to share my screen. So I'm going to do a new share. Here we go. Okay. Fingers crossed this will work. Hang on, this is where I forgot to prove. Let me know. There are experiences that you just don't get anywhere else. Og þetta er æðvinsinsinn dendra over rúm rara hugran sólum. Gómban, Jöllum. That was good, Kuning. Þeim hefur það vas eftir kennir jón í njarðu. Þannig góð sendi fólk að frófa. Fyrir þér fón ég þegar í er drúgan. Alvo lesi. Langi hvíli. In this leaf rare, wondrous wanden, world are for years, bell as breme, blood, weed as sprang, shill as ever, shed a land of in. Swa shall young go, my go, dear, where chum. 
Frommung, Vergiftern und Verderwärme verhindern und nicht der Öffnungen will es sie das von wie kommen. Leute ihr Lasten. Luft an den Schalen weg für ihr Wörter, Mann, ihr Feon. Fairly arbitrarily, I'm just stopping it there. Um, a very interesting watch with the links in this um, presentation. I don't know if you get to see that, but I, I would recommend looking at that. Certainly f far more worth... Uh, watching it being uh, performed by him, um, Benjamin Bagby, than myself on the Anglo-Saxon lyre. Um, it performed probably as it would have been performed. So it was um, a mixture of poetry and music, and it would have been there to inspire and to, to entertain. And then it moves on to, these are the first 11 lines of uh, Beowulf. So one of the things that um, the poet, and we don't think there was one poet for Beowulf. It was probably a traditional thing which was passed down from um, scop to scop, from, from poet to poet, is alliteration. Now, if you may cast your mind back to school, and alliteration is when the initial sound of a word um, is mirrored with the next word or... Yeah, usually the next word. So if I say a, um, the one from, the one sticks in my mind is the one from Pygmalion, bloody brown bread. It's the B sound, which you hear again and again. And in old English um, poetry, it doesn't necessarily happen in adjacent words. So this is the same stuff that you heard from the beginning. So what we gardena in year dagum, theod kuninga thrum yufronon, huda ethelingus ellen fremadon. So you see with the, Gardena, the spear Danes in Yea Dagum. So the mirror of the G sound or the Y sound in these two words is here. So that's the alliteration. Theod Kuninger Thrum Jufronen. So Theod Kuninger Thrum Jufronen. Who the Ethelingus Ellen Fremadon? Who Ethelingus? Ethelingus Ellen Fremadon. Oft shield scathing, scathing a threatum. Monotham, Maytham, Meod Settler of they are. So the M, M, M. So you've got the mirror. And the reason of why they, that was so important, of course, is if you've got 3,000 lines of text or that amount of story you want to tell, as well as it being catchy and powerful if you're doing it with the, um, the repetition of sounds, it also helps you remember it. So I think this is one of the things that lots of linguists seem to point to as probably being evidence that this was largely an oral tradition. This was something that was done um, orally until it was written down quite late in its life. So it's likely that um, it had been told for quite a while. In fact, it's set, set in the, uh, the sixth or seventh century, I think. It's talking about um, ancestral forebears from hundreds of years before. So it's likely that that story was being told for a number of uh, hundreds of years. Um, so that's one of the things which it would have used. Another thing which is, again, we've got no reveal here, so apologies, is something known as the kenning, which we don't really have in modern English very much, certainly not as a kind of a poetic device anymore, but it's something that was really powerful in Old English and Old Norse. 
And a kenning is a type of metaphorical um, device in poetry, which what it would do is it would describe something by its features rather than describing it explicitly. So you've got kennings for king that are in Beowulf, which include ring giver. So obviously the, the giving of a ring signifies somebody who's bestowing power, treasure giver, gold giver, homeland's guardian. So we've also got things for Grendel, which was the monster, um, hall watcher, corpse maker, shadow stalker, hell brute. So this is the, um, the ways that they would describe this monster. So corpse maker is particularly um, interesting there, isn't it? Shadow stalker. And there's some other, some great ones. There was, there was one actually, which you may not have spotted, which is in the 10th line of the um, the original uh, one that I read you. It says, Hronrada. So Hronrada is the whale road. That's one of the most famous ones in Beowulf. And it's just a kenning for the sea because the whale road is where the whale travels. So you've got that again here. You've got bone house, which is barn hus in Old English, which was the body because it's the house of bones. Um, you've got uh, the battle seat, which is a very good one as well, isn't it? Where you do battle from, which would be the saddle of your horse. So it's something that it's well as being very evocative, emotive. It's something that also would make things stick in the mind of the reciter. And it also was used as a bit of a placeholder in old English um, poetry. So you knew that if you needed to get something with a certain sound to, to get that alliteration, you might need to put a certain type of word in it. So you see the same phrases again and again. See with that, with ring giver and treasure giver and gold giver. Again and again, the structure is going to be the same. So the listener needs would need to know, have a bit of prior knowledge. Oh, yes, that's what he means by that. So if we go on to what Old English started out like, you um, certainly, almost certainly, won't be familiar with the Futhark runes, which is what we see on the left-hand side. This is the way that Old English was first represented when it came to these islands. Um, the Latin alphabet wasn't used until the 8th century. So the symbols which were used to represent Old English look like this. Um, and they're very unfamiliar to us today. There are a couple in there which were um, retained even when English took on the Latin alphabet because there were sounds that Old English needed that Latin didn't have. So, for instance, we've got the ash, which is an a, ah, a short a ah sound. We do sometimes see that in things like Aesop's fables and things like that. So that ah sound, the, that sound, or it's now known as an eth, which is a th sound, the thorn, which is again is a th sound. This is the difference between the, the voiced th, sorry, the voiceless th and the voiced th, which we have in English, but lots of languages don't have. So in modern English, we represent that with a th, but think about, think, the difference between that and think. So they're two different sounds actually, which we learn to recognize in modern English. Old English would have had a different symbol. And then the final one is the win. The win, or sometimes called the when, which is a w sound. A w sound in Old English. So from the 8th century on, English started to be represented, like it is with the, uh, the Beowulf uh, text, with the Latin alphabet, albeit with these additions. So this, again, was another reveal. So... The nature of the language changed quite a lot. And this is one of the, the things which you um, you get to recognise. If you study German or a language like German, you realise that Old English was a synthetic language. And what that means is it was very, very, very heavily inflected. It had three genders. So just like modern German, it had a masculine, a feminine and a neuter. It also had four, at least four cases. There was arguments for up to six, possibly seven cases for various ablative and instrumental cases that Old English may have had, but it definitely had four cases. So that's what um, designates in a sentence what's doing what in a sentence. So the example that is given here is the fact that stone in Old English was the word stan. It was a masculine noun. 
If it's the subject of the sentence, so the stone is on the floor, it would be sistan, the stone. If I want to put a modifier in it, like an adjective, se hefigastan, the heavy stone. If it's the object of my sentence, though, I see the heavy stone, it will be thonne hefigastan. So I've changed the word for the, so the, um, the article. I've also had to change the adjective. It gets even more complicated when I'm talking about the dative. So if I'm on top of the heavy stone, them hefigastane. If this, it belongs to the heavy stone, thus hevigenstanes. And that's the only ending which is still here in modern English. This is the apostrophe S which we've got in modern English is the only echo that we've got from the old English inflections which you had on words. By the time that the Normans came, this is how, what replaced it. So the really complicated um, synthetic language with all the endings were changing with the words for the were changing depending on their root their role in a sentence became the heavy stan the only changes were stanis in the genitive this stones belongs to and then the plural forms were still there but eventually they got eroded away this is the process of change which you see in old english um, from the early Old English period through to when the Vikings invaded, there was a need to coexist. There was a lot of intermarriage in the, um, in the Danelaw areas in particular, but all throughout the country. And the language was becoming less and less synthetic, less and less reliant on these cases and stuff, and more and more what we call today an analytic language. So an analytic language is one where word order tells you everything that you need to know about the sentence. So if I say, I see the heavy stone, I know that the heavy stone is the object of the sentence because that's the position it's in in the sentence. In a language like Old English, a synthetic language like Old English or Modern German, the word for the is what would tell you what's doing what in the sentence. Okay. A little bit of old English so we could just in case we do get our hands on a time machine and we, we head back. Here is some old English basics. So one to ten in basics are an, twain, thrill, fair, faith, or fifth, seox, siphon, echte, nihon, team. You can see the echoes of modern English, definitely, but also modern Dutch and modern German, which are very close to this. Words for hello, Weshal or Weshathale, Weshathale, different ones depending on who you're speaking to. What hattest thou? What hattest thou? So, what is your name? So, Old English had the word hatten, which was the verb to be called, which we lost that verb. And then, ich hatte, I am called, my name is, which learners of German would definitely recognize. Melikath vetu metane. Melikath vetu metane. Nice to meet you. So this is like a, a reflexive type of structure. Nice to meet you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening rather, and good night. Very close to their modern English, but also their modern West Germanic counterparts. So goodbye would be far yuzund, far yuzund, or farath yuzunda, or farath yuzunda, which is travel safely. So the word yuzund in Old English is very much like the modern German gesund, which we've got with gesundheit when somebody sneezes. Ich lufite, ich lufite, I love you. Everybody who's managed to stay till now still listening. Ja, jese for yes. Neza, ne, na, for no. Sprecheth English. Sprecheth English. Sprecheth English. Do you speak English? Ja, little. Ja, fair. Yeah, a little. Ich what? I know. Ich not? I don't know. Forgive me. Forgive me. Sorry. Sorry. Bitte. Again, any learners of modern German would recognize bitter from that one. Ich bitte there. I ask you, or please, ich bitte jou, I ask you, ich danke there, I thank you, ich danke there, 
I welcome, um, I thank you. So I'm going to, I think, end on that by thanking you. The only thing I'd point you in the direction of is if you are interested, this is my original um, sixth former copy of Beowulf that I've still got very well thumbed to this day. This one's a very good one, the Penguin Classics one, because it's got a glossary which includes probably 75% of the words with their old English middling, I'm sorry, modern English counterparts, really worth a read. This is the Bible for anybody who's planning to learn old um, English, which is an introduction to old English by Peter Baker, very much worth a read. And I read it many moons ago, but the best translation I've read of Beowulf into modern English was by Seamus Heaney. So if you ever get a chance of, to read that, that's very much a read, worth a read. If you prefer a podcast, I can't um, recommend this enough. It's an enormous um, project by um, a, a, an American lawyer by trade, who's obviously a, a historian and language enthusiast, and it's called the History of English podcast. It's got about 150 hour long episodes, but it's absolutely excellent. And it goes into really deep detail about um, the history of the languages, all the way back to Proto-Indo-European. It's really, really very good. Um, and a couple of the YouTubers, which are pretty good. Um, there's uh, something called the Lang Focus channel, which I've, I've, I've actually used as a source in this uh, presentation. But he does a really interesting one on English, which is um, a, a linguistic revivalist movement, which has got the idea of actually um, changing English to be purely Germanic. So television would be a far seer, things like that. Really good. Very interesting, thought-provoking. Simon Roper, he's, he's a really good um, YouTuber as well. He's a, actually an archaeologist, but he's got a really um, strong interest in uh, language. And I'm not entirely sure how you say that this guy's name, Dr. Thies Pork, who's, um, I would say, a Dutch-speaking professor. And he does a really good um, introduction to Old English. Um, I think that's enough. Michael, I think... Um, I think we've we've done it just about